Hey everyone, welcome back to another Attack on Dragon Ball video. Fluff here, and today we're looking at the top 10 4 drafts for the Dragon Ball TCG. But before we get into that, please like, subscribe, all that fun YouTube -y stuff, and everyone say hi. Today I'm joined by Jake and Jim. What's going on, y'all? That used to be in second. This is yeah, I know. I was I was surprised, and I appreciated it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's we're we're doing it different today. Bancroft's not joining us today. Um, as prefaced earlier, we are talking about the top 10 four drops. So a couple rules behind this. We're not talking about any counters. We're not talking about any super combos. And we're not really including any card that appears on the banned or limited list. So with that being said, this list will not directly include some of those cards that we might mention them as honorable mentions. And with that, we'll hop right into the list at number 10. Number 10, we've got a tie coming out around the time of Crossworlds. We've got the promo Bardock Will of Iron, and then we've also got, I believe it's a promo Grade 8 Prince Vegeta as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, both. And they were both featured heavily in the Mega Frieza Apes deck that utilized the March of the Great Apes to spam out on the field. This was a meta-defining deck at that point. And I even think there was some tricolor Ginyu decks that featured this engine very heavily mm -hmm. around that time. But, you know, the ability to search, put blockers on the field that were 20,000 that could applicably push your opponent aggressively for nothing. I mean, the Great Ape Vegeta searched the deck out for other apes, which put one in the drop area itself when you used it in a combo. So you got your two apes off the march of the Great Apes almost instantly for using the, the Vegeta card out. Like, I, this is really the archetype that inspired the first Arata list. Not quite the first ban list, but Frieza, Mecha Frieza, was the first major Arata. And it's largely because of these two cards and their interaction with March of the Great Apes. I mentioned Progenitor there uh, in my head because I had the uh, the, the memory of uh, Storm decks utilizing the uh, uh, Great Ape Bardock oh, to evolve yeah, I, on top of them. Yeah, uh, I, for late game pushes. Well, and the, you know they they both seen minor representation. Like I'm pretty sure both cards saw some use in variants of the blue, yellow, brawly ape decks. Um, there was around that time there was a yellow, red ape deck uh, that Jake was telling us about that saw a fair amount of representation around the same time that Shinjita was kicking off. Yeah, it was around set seven, and both of those decks. Uh were pretty strong. They also utilized uh, that great, that absolute defense, great ape Vegeta. But that's, you know, a, a five drop. So next up at number nine, we have Hidden Awakening Tail, part of the original Veggies package in series two. So it's a big critical body, twenty k criticals of fantastic skill, and it was fantastic even when the uh, it dropped. You choose one of your battle cards, KO it. Then choose any number of your opponent's battle cards, add up to five or less, and KO them. At the time in the game when this card was viable and seeing a lot of play, you would see a lot of, like, two to three drops on the field, and you wouldn't see a big wide fields very often. So this card dropped it, and it was basically a field wipe. It just nuked everything. It's almost unheard of to have uh, less than five cards in hand, but on swing, you get to draw one if you have five or less cards. At the time, in, at the time in the game, it really wasn't all that. Yeah. You know, drawing wasn't as effective, so you've really got that draw off per effect more often than not. And there was a another piece of the veggies package that said your own cards cannot be KO'd by your own card skills, so it took out all the downsides of this card, and it was just such a dreaded bomb and it's had had a massive effect on the meta at the time and looking back on it it's kind of like head scratching to see like you really paid the energy for that card like it doesn't seem worth it but it was one of the biggest bosses back in the day this card came out around the time that i've really got hard into the game and i remember for the longest time until we got over realms at least hidden awakening kale was the form of removal like, there were other little things here and there, but Kale was the removal that you worried about. Like, there wasn't any other removal card in the game, really. I mean, the Cell Leader had a little bit of removal on it, I think, and the Brawly Leader from Set 1 had a little bit of removal. But outside of that, Kale 
was the removal card. This is what you use to keep your opponent's field in check. So coming in at number eight, we've got another tie. Uh, Kale, the Awakened Sister, and Khalifa, the Awakened Sister. Um, both of these were used really heavily in the U6 Kava deck that came out with the Set 7 Assault of the Saiyans booster, booster pack. And uh, these were really powerful because combined with a another battle card, a blue-yellow Chomp of Autos, you could combo with these for free and play them on top of one drops. And even if you had to pay the energy for them, their effects were super powerful for the time. The Kale was critical and bounced an opponent's battle card after negating its skills so they didn't get any, get any like on death effects and the Khalifa just rested a card which included an energy which was really one of the few ways to rest energy back in the day which was what made the Kaba deck so powerful when it first came out. Kaba kind of fell off and honestly I think is in a huge need of a reboot. I feel like if they rebooted the Kaba leader these cards would come back into the meta that day in a state of the game where the leaders put in 60 percent of the work over the course of a game the universe six leaders are really the hindering factor behind what makes universe six viable like Kaba was really good on its first release but once people figured out how to play against it khalifa and kale couldn't carry the entire weight despite being absolutely fantastic cards and moving right on at number seven, we've got Bojack, the Resonant Agent of Destruction. Featured in the expansion set five, Unity of Destruction, this was the game's first introduction to the arrival mechanic. This card was, at the time, wasn't, you know, when, when everyone was really hyped on the green-red expansion, but the longer time went on, people started to realize that this card in particular, the Resonant Agent of Destruction, Bojack, had so much versatility in a card so it was a 20,000 that you played for one on a rival blue yellow that chose one of your opponent's battle cards and switched it to rest mode, then milled the top card of the deck, which at the time, Chinimba decks were still incredibly viable. But more importantly, we saw with like the advent of the Brawly Ape decks, we saw this card used as a defensive card in those mixed color strategies. So like the blue, yellow, Zamas decks, more importantly, the, the Brawly blue, yellow, ape decks, and then really any other strategy that used it. And even today, this is a valuable contender, even if by today's standards, slightly being knocked off by Hit and Goku, the blue, yellow dual attack blocker, Bojack is su was such a contender for its time. And I, I really feel like this card warped the game on its introduction to the card pool. You mentioned the uh, blue-yellow Goku hit. I I always see these two cards being very comparable, where yeah. Bojack is kind of a double negate of being able to tap down a card, making it a non-threat, as well as being able to block Goku hit, being able to block twice. I think it really comes down to the arrival cost being either one yellow energy or one blue energy. Yeah. But I see Bojack as just being a much more valuable card in my eyes. I would prefer to run Bojack in almost every situation that I could run Goku Hit. And I think what edges Bojack out over the Goku Hit as far as making this list is it does have the Agent of Destruction tag, so it will uh, help out those strategies in addition to being a powerful card outside of AOD and outside of uh, like traditional mill decks. Yep. And I really feel like it, it, it's, it's also a big function of player preference too where i think bojack is a doubly defensive card the goku hit is it's got the double defense or the double attack depending on however you want to swing that card i do think that bojack is safer and probably the more solid option overall which is why ultimately it made the list and goku hit did not so at number six we have a card that has way too many effects for one single card even at four energy this card at all cost vegeta so on play you get a card draw and a switching an energy to active mode he is technically a three drop if you really want to play that activate main you get a self awakener he gains 3k power for every single energy you have 
If you have five or more, you get to KO one of your opponent's battle cards, and he gains triple strike for the turn. Just too many effects for one card, and to this day, still way too many effects. I don't think we've seen a card similar to this card in any current set if I can I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that has this many effects and covers this wide of a range of effects. I think the only thing that gets close is like Obuni after Image Slash. I mean we definitely have cards that have equivocal number of effect and it, but I mean when you just think about what this card does, this card does everything that you want it to do. And we even had a comment within the last few days of someone telling us they topped at their locals running a blue deck that ran at all cost Vegeta. Like, it's just wild to think that, like, here we are moving, we're about to be in set 14 format, and at all cost Vegeta is still relevant in some rogue strategies, even if it's just at the local level. Ten sets later. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I use this card as late as set seven or eight for, like, backup kills and control decks. I I used it in uh, Vecu Ramp yeah. as I, I think you ran it at a one or two of just in case the triple strike on win could be relevant. It even was seen as fusion material for Gogeta 7 decks before that oh, card was banned. Dude, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, oh, this, yeah. Card, this card has, like, transcended so many metas and has been relevant in different ways in every single one of them. Oh my and gosh. I, I could see this card in the future if we get any more vegeta support or any sort of more blue support that allows this card to come back into the meta full force like it was i still think it's going to be still one of the greatest cards in the game yeah i mean it's adding i mean there, this card is all advantage it's a self awakener if you're at that point still not able to awaken by the time you get to four it's a self awakener so on play it's easily a plus two in hand and then if you are at five or more energy then it gets the huge power boost and triple strike on top of that. I, I could see this card being viable in the new uh, Universe 7 Gohan deck with the universe uh, with Warrior of Universe 7 tag. Yeah. You know, this could be a splashable card in that deck. Give that deck a little bit of a boost. Even even in um, SS4 Vegeta as a surprise triple strike, this card is live on like turn three most times, or turn mm -hmm. two. Next up, we've got a card that I've enjoyed for a long time. It's Surprise Attack Frieza. Uh, it's just a 15k critical for 4, but you're never really going to cast it for 4. Uh, auto, activate this skill when your opponent's battle card is KO'd. If Surprise Attack Frieza is not in play, play it in your battle area from your hand. So it's just a free 15k crit that you get for... KOing an opponent's battle card, which is something you're going to want to do in most control decks anyway. And 15k crit for free slides perfectly into those kind of strategies. Th this card would have been fine as just a free 15k beater to play off of uh, KOing an opponent's battle card. Yep. But the fact that it has critical on top of that, there's so many ways to slip this card in and become a massive threat even at 15k power. Uh, cases where you swing into opponent's blocker, they block with it. You KO that battle card, you get, it's like, hey, you blocked my leader swing, now you have to face this 15k critical. Yeah. You know, a much worse thing to face down. It, it's almost insult to injury. And being green, it fits in so well with the green strategy, and almost every green card in this game KOs a battle card at this point. And it, it's also completely splashable. Like, it's not tied to any color. So any kind of strategy where you want to KO opposing battle cards can th consider this card for their list. The thing that stands out to me about Surprise Attack Frieza is how ahead of its time this card was. So this card was introduced as a BCC club promo, participation promo for tournaments. Before we had tournament packs, you would just come and you would get a single promo card for participating. Everyone was super hype over Goten, and then everyone was super hype over Frieza. But the problem at the time in that game is when you look at relevant meta strategies at the time, they weren't about KOing your opponent's cards. They were about milling your opponent out, advantaging your opponent out through combos and things like that. It wasn't about blowing out your opponent's field. So it wasn't until much later in the game's history that Surprise Attack Frieza really picked up in its usability. And because it was introduced so early, I feel like the card is forgotten. And a lot of decks that it could be highly useful. 
Like, this card is just way before its time. And thank goodness it was reprinted in those Ultimate decks. Otherwise, two or three years from now, these things would be $20, $30 a piece. Moving up next, we've got a uh, number four spot, Bardock Awakened Instincts, released in the special anniversary box. This, when I think about an the first anniversary box, this is the card that I think of. I think this is the card that has had the most ongoing influence out of that first anniversary box. So this card is almost exclusively used in aggro decks that want to extend its plays and extend its hand size. So Turn 2 Han, Majin Vegeta are two prime examples of the types of decks that Bardock want to be used in. It's a free 20,000 Overrun 4 that draws two and then forces you to discard one. So if you draw something that's dead for that aggro turn, like just like an extra card or something that's not going to help you win the game, you just get it out of your hand, get it out of the way while feeding your own resource. And honestly, I've seen this card used in other deck strategies when it just needed to draw. Like if it had ways to feed the drop area, but just needed a way to draw. This is a perfectly fine, it's essentially a plus zero because it's, if you count losing itself and then the card that you have to discard, there's no net hand advantage, but it moves all of the resources in your deck. Overrealm tends to, uh, Overrealm early on tended to be a band-aid to a deck's biggest weakness. If it had issues with removal, you would throw a, uh, like a mass saiyan in there to blow up, a, blow up the field. If your deck had trouble with drawing, you would either run Scientist Boo or Awaken Instinct. Scientist Boo was tend to be more of a game ender, uh, but this was like a great middle ground for that where it gave you a fantastic aggressive, aggressive option of being free and a 20k beater, as well as getting the quality of cards in your hand uh, a boost. Many of the decks that have included Bardock have either been banned or had cards limited out of them or have been banned in best of one or cards that interact well with this card have been banned or limited. Yet Bardock continually dodges the list i think he very sneakily has the xeno tag so as we get more and more xeno support i think this is definitely a card to watch and number three love him or hate him i've gotten very close with this card a booty after image slash uh we mentioned it earlier this card has so many good effects on it and became pretty much blue saving race for a while he's deflect which if you're paying for an entry for him, you want him to be deflect. If a after image token is in play, he can't be KO'd. And on play, he gets three of those tokens, 15k power, zero combo cost, and 5k combo power. And then activate main, your opponent reveals the top card of their deck, battle card, you get to untap an energy uh, at, the, at the opponent's main phase. And your opponent also has to shuffle the deck after this. So it feels amazing to hit a secret rare off the top of the opponent's deck i so many times my opponents flip cell x and it's like okay you gotta shuffle it like you lost cell x off the top of the deck i hope you can cheat your shuffle there but or a, a super combo or something like that that you know could easily turn the tide of the game the, this card has has just so many fantastic effects and it's so versatile in the way that you use it if the cards in your hand are very good and you don't want to combo them off play a boonie there's 50 there's 15k worth of combo power that he plays off of himself uh if you need aggression that's your way of doing it play those tokens turn them sideways if you need targets for stuff like path to the infinite if you're playing a rogue ui goku strategy he's a four drop that gives you so much value off of play that you pick him up and play him again the next turn so much value off of this card and a boonie is an exercise in mathematics for card players. So if you don't see why this card is valuable, look at the fact that it's a four drop. Now it plays three after image tokens, which are 15,000 each. Now, usually in order to get a 15,000 body on the field, you have to pay two energy to get that out. Just generally as a rule, two energy equals 15,000. So at so each of those tokens are each worth about two energy a piece, making a boonie a total play value of 10 energy, but then you get to restand an energy. So that's 11 energy value. And then shuffling your opponent's deck is arguably another value of a single energy. So it's, 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 it's a, the equivalent to playing 12 energy worth in a four drop card. 
and to pile on if you want to do your metrics through card economy this is four cards worth of combo power in your deck that takes one deck slot illustrated by the fact that i don't think there's been a topping blue strategy that did not include a boonie since draft box two was coming and at number two we've got chain attack trunks now this card came out in series three so the cross worlds uh starter decks but this card was still seeing play in uh set seven when i came to the game we honestly just casually you know outside of making content talk about this card or like try and find ways to make this card work again because both this card and its uh evolution material uh in intensifying power trunks are both cards worthy of top 10 slots for their uh, relative energy. So when you play this card, you get to choose one battle card from your hand with 15k power or less and play it. There's very little restriction on that if you pay close attention. No color, no energy cost. So as the game goes on, the possibilities for Chain Attack just get better and better. really feel like Chain Attack is one of those cards that is a constant influencer in the design process of cards because if you look at other various card games you'll have a card that is a high cost or high resource dump of a card that is a low stat line with a fantastic effect that's that's true for magic that's true for Yu-Gi-Oh! that's true for pokemon like it's just true all the way around and i feel like because of chain attack trunks when was the last time we got a 15,000 battle power card that was above, like, an energy two or three? Biddy or Bobbity. The, the, the red one out yeah. of set three? Yeah. <laughs> to, to speak on the how this card boosted every other 15k in the game, Chain Zeno is the obvious one. You would play Zeno the Playing God and basically reset the game. Both players shuffle their... Uh, their uh, field a hand into the deck and then draw five yep. and it was just a stark reset and it got to the point where people forgot what this card actually does they never read the card other than the play the 15k because i would turn it sideways at opponents active mode battle cards and they're like oh you can only attack in rest mode i was like oh no he has the permanent people would forget that this card has that permanent on top of it just because of the value of yep. playing chain attack or playing zeno off of them just to top it off, a 20k for 2 energy is pretty good as far as energy economy goes. Yeah, if even, you're, if even you're by evolving. today's standards, it's not bad. We were just talking about Obuni hard casting him for 4. I mean, the, he's a 20k. Yeah, well, I mean, and considering you got to play, what was the Plane God? Plane God was a 7 drop? Yeah, 7 drop, 15k. Yeah, so you're playing a 7 drop and a 4 drop for let's call it three energy right because you've got the one drop trunks and then you're going to go two yeah on on chain attack so let's call it 11 energy worth of card for four or for three or you could play the bobbity which depending on the state of the game you know the bobbity got to scry what the top eight cards yeah the seven or eight and then it could grab you know a kaioken goku and another big red bomb and put them so depending on your target for chain attack trunks and the hits on those cards you could easily get you know 16 17 18 energy worth of value out of the two energy evolve on this card and to speak on how sought after this card was at the time the card would averaged around six to seven bucks on you know uh, reselling sites yeah. But people would go and buy the starter decks for 10 bucks and make money off of that purchase just from these two yeah. cards that were in the box. I know I know in the local shop that I was playing at when this starter deck was relevant, this was one of the starter decks that when they got them in, they would just crack the starter decks open and sell the singles out of the starter decks because the singles were more valuable to the shop than actually selling the sealed starter decks. Yeah, there's some decent stuff in that one for the time. Yeah. I'm pulling it up right now. I mean, Chain Attack is a dollar sixty, so two two bucks almost today. So yeah. 
And I mean, that's not bad. I mean, and and I really feel like this is one of the cars that the cards that kept Pan relevant for so long. Oh, for sure. Easily. So, Fluff, it's about that time. You think we're ready to move into some honorable mentions? Absolutely, my dude. Um, no list would be complete without a set of honorable mentions. So, up first, we've got Belmont. Uh, what? It, Belmont, Belmont, double devastation. Introduced in Series 9 Universal Onslaught. Belmont, I feel like, is very... The conversation surrounding Belmont is very similar to the conversation surrounding Bardock, the Awakened Instincts. So Belmont was a blocker 20,000 four drop that basically, in order to play him, you just chose three of your battle cards, placed them in the owner's drop area, and then you played this card. And then on play, you chose one of your opponent's battle cards, no energy requirements, and just KO'd it. This was another fantastic play extender. And one of the more prolific plays that I remember about this card is if you had a big green body. So the big seven drop boo or the eight drop success or Gohan, and you get two other cards on the field, you would swing with everything, bell mod everything off the field, and then drop the Brawly Secret Rare and rip your opponent's hand out. It was basically a free way to control when you could play that Brawly Secret Rare. And I really wanted to include this card in the top 10, but the card hasn't done a ton for meta relevant decks outside of the few cards, or the few decks that we already touched on with Bardock Awakened Instincts and just hasn't been that impactful compared to everything else in the top 10. My honorable mention is Shenron Figure of Majesty. Uh, this is one of my favorite cards in the game, even though it's fallen way out of favor recently. Uh, hopefully they'll print more support for it in the future. But it, it's basically the game's first experimentation with unisons. Because it's a battle card that can't attack, and every turn it has an activate main where you can choose to either untap two energy, draw cards, there's just so much you can do with this uh, one battle card that uh, hopefully we get to a state of the game where either paying four for this or uh, playing it through some kind of uh cheat engine becomes viable again because uh, I really love this card. And for my honorable mention, I chose SS3 Tag Team Sun Gohan. This card was from Draftbox 4. It was one of the major chase cards of the set. And for good reason. He gave he gave Black a free play option off of the Overrealm skill. He comes into play when a Black battle card leaves the battle area due to a skill. And he's either a defensive option or a more aggressive option. So he's seen a lot of play in Overrealm decks just due to the Overrealm skill. He became a massive problem in the U3 decks that would abuse the effect of the U3 battle cards removing cards from the field. Uh, and he would play for free and give you extended plays. And then recently, you're seeing a lot of play with him in Dark Broly uh, due to now, the now eroded effect of uh, placing 30k battle cards from your battle area into the drop area to give your leader a boost that would also just give you a free 15k blocker on field just for your troubles. Insane value off of the card and can kind of fall into the realm of the surprise attack Frieza in a way of value-wise. And capstoning the top 10 list, we've got our number one. Coming out of draft box one, was there any question that this could would be any other card? We've got Bardock, Grade 8 Raiders Warcry. This card is the definition of meta defining. So for two energy on a combo, at the end of the combo, you get to play it, it taps an opponent's card, you draw a card, then you've got a $20,000 or 20,000 power double strike on the field. And a lot of people looked over Draftbox 1. I attribute Draftbox 1's price hike almost exclusively to Raiders Warcry and then the uh, the three drop draw Goku 8, almost exclusively. Once people figured out how good those cards were, like it sounded really bad, pay two to combo with a 10K. But then when you consider everything that the card does once it's played, this card is just ridiculous on resolution. You know, it, it's so good that your opponent, at this point where we are now today, your opponent is almost conditioned to respond to this card. You know, once they see it hit the combo area, they start getting that counterplay ready, or they start formulating what card am I going to use to either tap the card, negate its skills, neg it out, KO it, warp it, send it back to hand. What am I going to do? Your opponent just, just neurotically 
will go through the steps to keep this guy off the field. And really, it's just a 20,000 double strike. I mean, we've talked about triple strikes in this list for four energy. Yeah. Like, I think what's so good about Raiders Warcry is you can play it on your opponent's turn. And especially in, like we were talking about that multicolor apes list and like Mecha Frieza and, you know, any blue-yellow strategy, this card is basically always alive. It's offense and defense, and like we were talking about with Obuni, it's all of those things on a single card, so it lets you put more cards in your deck. Like, as the game has gone on, I think this card has, like, fallen a little bit in overall power level, like, compared to the rest of the game. But when this card first hit, there was very little uh, that could deal with it efficiently, especially uh, if it was played on you during your turn and you were out of energy. Every time I expect Raiders Warcry to get like to lose its viability in a format, like I remember right around set ten, we were having this big conversation how we were like Raiders Warcry is getting powered out of the game, where it's becoming less and less viable. And then turn around almost a year later, Mecha Frieza is topping, running three copies of it. And it, like the nothing else in the game really does what Raiders Warcry does. There are very few cards in this game for each color where you build a deck with it and it's just so hard not to include. Like Sensu Bean, you build a blue deck. Your auto instinct is to put Sensu Bean in it red you will definitely put one of the fantastic red negates into the deck we have so many yellow it's raiders war cry like yeah you build a yellow deck that's the first card i'm looking at for the deck and it's like am i gonna run this at a three of or a two of yeah am i running two or four of this this card yeah. this card and basil to me are the yellow staples i mean they're flexible i mean you know and we get we used to get all the time on the channel what are budget-friendly alternatives to Raiders Warcry? And there really isn't, even to, I guess now there are kind of alternatives to Ra Raiders Warcry, but at the time, there was nothing even close. Yes, I could tell you a card that's a double striker. Yes, I could give you a card that draws. Yes, I can give you a card that taps a card. Yes, I can give you a card that gives you 10,000 combo power. But can I give you a card that could do all of that during either your turn or your opponent's turn? No way. And that is it for the four drop top 10 video. Thank you so much guys for tuning in. We really like making these videos. It's usually a pretty big debate building these, but hopefully you guys agree. Of course, these are, or hopefully you enjoyed it. You don't necessarily have to agree with us. This is of course our personal opinion based on our interaction with the game and just trying to review the game from a historical aspect. So as always, leave a comment below. We do appreciate you guys. On the screens, a couple videos for you to check out if you haven't already. As always, read your cards, know your plays, let us make the mistakes so that you don't have to, and fluff out.